My name is Porter Anderson. I'm the editor in chief at Publishing Perspectives, and we're delighted you're joining us. Uh, we are the autonomous news medium of Frankfurt Buchmesse, and we're coming to you today thanks to the International Publishers Association. We want to wish you a happy Translation Day. It is International Translation Day in the world, a holiday that's based at the United Nations, of course. And that is what we're on about here today as we start looking at the global landscape for translation rights. We have a very interesting team of folks for you to hear from today. I'm excited to get, uh, get them to you so that you can hear what they have to say. They're coming to the issue of translation rights and how translation, translated literature is moving around the world from four different sectors of the world publishing industry. And I think you'll find that their, their various viewpoints are fascinating. Um, it's in some cases, a little bit in conflict. In many cases, they're in sync. It makes for a great discussion. We've had a, a pre-talk that was pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, so with me today are Paola Segi, who handles book fairs and international relations for the Italian Publishers Association. Uh, I am a person who has favorite publishers associations, and AIE is certainly one of them. Uh, Mariana Warth is joining us from Brazil, where she is the publisher of Palace Editora, an independent publishing house. Michael Cooperson, you may know, a translator of real influence. He is professor of Arabic in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA in California. He is here at 4 a.m. his time in the newer world. And he is the 2021 Sheikh Zayed Book Award winner in translation for his book, I recommend this, from NYU Press called Impostures, 50 Rogues Tales Translated 50 Ways. It's based on the work of Al Hariri. And it is fascinating and it's getting a lot of traction even in the mainstream press, uh, which is wonderful to see. This is exactly what should be happening for translated literature around the world. And finally, uh, Nestan Kavinikadze is with us uh, from Georgia uh, with its beautiful language and alphabet, something we saw explicated very nicely a few years ago at Frankfurt Book Mesa when Georgia was our guest of honor at the trade show. Um, she will be talking to us from the author's standpoint. Uh, since we're coming to you from the IPA, the International Publishers Association, I'm going to ask Paula to start us off as one of the member association's representatives and tell us, Paula, what do you see from your position working as you do across so many publishers and with so many publishers from the standpoint of an, a national association in the world marketplace? Where do you see the outreach of uh, translated literature being most successful today? Thank you, Porter. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me today. Uh, well, I, I'm Paola Segi of the Italian Publishers Association, and since my first job for the association, which consisted in a research on the translation grants given uh, by some foreign countries, I've always been involved in the promotion of Italian publishing abroad. So I work in the organization of Italian national stands, uh, in trade missions, grants and subsidies, uh, and in projects for the participation of Italy as guest of honor. Uh, in Rome, we organize a book fair where I run the professional area, uh, which includes a, a right center and an invitation program, just to say something about my, my work. Um, well, today I'm, I'm going to talk about the export of Italian translation rights, which has increased uh, a lot over the course of the last uh, 20 years. And I will provide an overview of the different uh, policies and activities which have helped to achieve this, uh, this goal. Uh, I will be talking from the perspective of a publisher's association, as Porter said, um, a publisher's association which works also in the promotion of our book industry abroad in collaboration with the national institutions. So in the field of the translations, I, I just give you some uh, general information. We continue to buy more than uh, we sell, but the gap between uh, the two trends has uh, narrowed consistently over the, the years. In 2001, I was well at the beginning of my work uh, uh, here. Uh, we sold about uh, 1,800 titles and we bought three times as much. 
while today we can say that we sell virtually uh, as much as we buy and in certain cases uh, such as the uh, children's and young adults books uh, we uh, sell more than uh, we buy Mm, the base of this change is, on, on one hand, the editorial production, which is more and more uh, capable of attracting uh, foreign uh, publishers and foreign readers. And on the other hand, uh, the work done by the public and the private sector together, so also the work done by the association over the, this period. Uh, around 20 years ago, our association started uh, uh, a more continuous and fruitful collaboration and dialogue with the Italian Trade Agency, which is uh, the public body promoting uh, Italian companies uh, abroad, not only the cultural one, and together with the Italian Trade Agency, also with uh, all the institutions devoted to the promotion of the Italian culture at national and uh, international level. So each year we build a, a program that usually includes the participation uh, with collective national stands in the main uh, book fairs uh, all over the world. We organize a trade mission to discover uh, new markets. And, and so it depends on the years that there can be other, uh, other activities. Um, Speaking of book fairs, uh, an important role in uh, the export of our books uh, is played by uh, our presence as guest of honor, because being a guest of honor in, in a fair is, um, for us, is, has always been a unique opportunity to, to showcase uh, our authors, our publishers, um, with a big increase in the translation uh, flow. Uh, in 2002, I remember that we were uh, guests of honor in Paris. It was uh, really a, a, a big and important uh, event for us. And in, in, on that occasion, even though the relations between uh, our publishers uh, have always been strong, the relations between uh, uh, Italian and French publishers, well, that event brought to uh, a major increase in in the export and export, uh, import and export, sorry, of rights uh, between uh, the two countries. And the same happened some years later in uh, Guadalajara with the Spanish market, and more recently uh, with the uh, Arabic and the Russian market, uh, thanks to our participation uh, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi and, um, and in Moscow. Uh, now we have uh, two big events in the next year, and we, we, we really look to them with great interest. We will uh, be back in Paris as guest of honor in 23 and uh, in Frankfurt in 2024. Uh, concerning the promotion uh, of our books to a foreign audience, I have also to mention the support given by the institution for the organization of invitation and fellowship programs during the main Italian book fairs. So we have a special uh, programs during uh, Bologna book fair, which is the main uh, book fair for the children's sector, uh, the Turing book fair, which is the main general public book fair in Italy, and also um, during the Rome book fair. Uh, the Rome book fair is devoted only to small and medium publishers. It's organized by the uh, association, association itself. And well, well by, the, the, by the way, we uh, will be taking back, uh, we will uh, come back again in person uh, at the beginning of December, and we have uh, an invitation uh, program for uh, uh, foreign uh, publishers. Um, of course, uh, another essential tool to support uh, books abroad is translation grants. We, uh, in Italy, we have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, issuing uh, an annual call for application for translated books abroad. Then we have the Ministry of Culture offering uh, awards for the translation of Italian books. And the SEPS, which is a no-profit organization offering grants only for uh, scientific works. Uh, we saw last year how important uh, uh, are the translation grants, because uh, last year when uh, 
many book fairs were cancelled or transferred online. Uh, Italian publishing was, uh, let me say, surprisingly uh, able to remain more or less stable in terms of um, export of rights. And this was also thanks to a special call uh, uh, for the translation of Italian works by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Right now we have a, a, a new call by the Center for Books and Reading, which is uh, a, um, an institute depending from the Ministry of Culture. And uh, just a few words because the, the call is open until uh, the end of October. Uh, it's open to all kinds of books and languages, uh, but translation into French and German will be given priority in view of our participation as guest of honor in Paris and in Frankfurt. And then English too, of course, because sometimes uh, it can help to, uh, to have a, a translation in English to, to have a translation also in, in other languages. Uh, last year, we also organized, uh, since uh, as the book fairs were cancelled, so we, we tried to, to support publishers with other activities, and we organized some um, bilateral online meetings with other countries uh, aimed at the exchange of rights. Then there, um, there was the launch of a new website called the new newitalianbooks.it, which promotes uh, Italian uh, books um, abroad. And, and, and uh, well, another thing that helped a lot uh, above all last year was a European project. Uh, we are also active in this kind of activities. It's uh, the Aldus app, which is uh, coordinated by the association. And it played an important role because it gathers around 20 European book fairs and develops many initiatives. So from fellowship programs in, in the book fairs of the network to research on how European countries collect data on translation to an online directory on translation grants in different uh, European and not European countries that publishers can uh, consult for, uh, for free. Uh, last, uh, I would like to underline the, the importance of training for publishers, even in this field. We, uh, we organize uh, every year, we have a, an annual training program, which includes also courses and webinars on buying and selling rights uh, and on copyright in, uh, in general. So these are more or less the, the things that we, we do, uh, of course, uh, always with the, the always or mostly with the public support. And that's all. So we, we are still far from having, unfortunately, the same international reach as other countries, but I think that uh, we are uh, on the right track. I think you are too, and thank you for this, Paola. I think one of, one of the things we were talking about earlier is, is this multiplicity of the approach that is being used uh, by, by your team in, in uh, Milan and, and throughout Italy. The, the pushing every button, as we say, and yeah. <laughs> to make sure that no stone is left unturned. And th this is really how you get it off the ground. Uh, it, it does seem to work that way. Um, one of the things you were sp you're speaking of Aldous work too, which I'm very pleased about because one of the things that your, your folks are doing there is bringing the different um, cultures who report their rights uh, information into alignment in terms of what categories of information they're, they're bringing in, which data they put together so that then the different cultures working together on this will be, as we say, comparing apples to apples yeah. instead of apples to oranges. And one of the great problems we have in the world industry is this is a moment where diversity is not always so good, is that many of our various countries and cultures and national industries report in different ways. And it's very hard to compare their progress to each other. So the more of that alignment we can do, the better. And I, I thank you for working on that too, for all of us. 
Um, and again, for this this report on on what a great job AIE and your team are doing. I think it's, I think it's exciting. <laughs> Thank you. And it's great yes, to it's, see it rising like it's doing, you know? Yes, it's really exciting. And I have to say that during the pandemic, it was uh, uh, really difficult to, to work, of course, uh, for, for everybody. But I think that uh, the association did uh, really a, a great job, uh, not only from the international point of view, but also here in Italy. So we were able to, to talk to the government in a certain way, to work together with other uh, uh, associations, uh, such as the, uh, like the, the Bookseller Association. And we all together gained uh, uh, really important measures for, uh, for the sector. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to say myself, one of the reasons that I, I have such high regard for AIE is that your president, Ricardo Franco Levy, and, uh, and your uh, culture minister, um, Dario Franceschini, Franceschini, have worked so beautifully together yeah. in, in order to make the, the powers that be, to make Rome understand what was needed, and yeah. the very fundamental importance of the book industry and of reading and of culture on the broader scale, as you say, with sister organizations to that nation. I mean, this is what we turn to Italy for. And <laughs> it's, it's been quite beautiful to see how, how well Ricky was able to interpret this for everyone and how willing Dario was to come in together and, and see this, this teamwork has been just great. I wish we saw it in more countries. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Mariana, may I turn to you next, please? I'm, I'm another, another association, by the way, that I'm very impressed with is the Brazilian Publishers Group that has become increasingly um, adept at using technological outreach uh, so that meetings are happening online during these years of the pandemic. Um, trading is happening online. Very, very interesting and forward-thinking uh, process with Fernando Dantas, I think at yes. the helm. So we've all been impressed with that. From your position as a publisher, tell me what it looks like in, in the Brazilian market. And then you look out at the world and how, how is this going for you? Well, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for some. And um, thank you for the invitation. Um, well, I think that uh, um, uh, the pandemics uh, changed a lot the way people are interacting in this uh, business uh, sector of publishing. And we all had to adapt. And I think that uh, the group of the Brazilian publishers, I don't know, for those who don't know, the Brazilian publishers is a group of editors. It's not all editors from, not all publishers from Brazil but a group that, of uh, publishers that are interested in uh, taking part of international fairs, selling and buying rights or other services or uh, uh, in the publishing industry. And this group uh, is organized for that and being prof professionalized, if this word exists, uh, to, to work better in the, um, international industry. And I think that uh, during the pandemics, I think uh, the, the Brazilian publishers managed to organize very well and to, to, to give the publishers the opportunity of these virtual meetings uh, during the, the book fairs that happened uh, uh, virtually, like uh, Bologna, like Frankfurt, like Guadalajara, the main uh, fairs. So they organized matchmakings and virtual meetings uh, on a platform, and it worked very well. I took part of many, and it was really nice. Would, would you say something for this? No, no, I was just saying good. I, I'm glad that you had had the experience and that you found it to be effective too. I, it, it's almost an irony in, in that some of us who, who enjoy being together so much in person at these events have been a little chagrined maybe to find that it can be so effective online, but for business, thank God that it is effective online. It's, well, it's um, I think been that something that somehow, people could do. 
Yeah, I think somehow, I mean, we meet in person in the fairs, but uh, the business will be done af very after because we have to exchange mm -hmm. many emails, contracts and discuss many small things that actually doesn't happen when we meet. We meet because it's, it's a way to, to articulate, to, to see that uh, this person does a, a very good job and to, to, to create a link with people that, uh, that's a business of trust. I mean, we are so far away to sign contracts and to publish books that uh, perhaps you will never go to a, this other country and, and to believe that uh, uh, it's something that uh, is, is interesting for someone else and it will work out. So these meetings, I think it, they are useful for, for make these connections and they, are re and they really are because during the pandemics, uh, I think that people who already knew each other could strengthen these, uh, these, uh, these partnerships more than before because it's uh, more difficult actually to find new partners when you are not there to shake their hands. So the pandemics were, were good to strengthen this, the already, the, the partnership that already existed, I think. And I think, well, I think what you're saying makes sense. It's, it's, um, it's, and it's good to see this mechanism available because now we can do both, which is yeah, exactly. Have. Yeah. But uh, since the pandemics doesn't, didn't last only one year, we are in the second year of pandemics and I don't know if we can expect for the next year some waves, some uh, that uh, moments that will be better and moments that will be worse to be able to travel. I think these um, uh, virtual meetings will come to stay uh, at least uh, uh, the, the fairs would uh, offer hybrid uh, options to take part of it. But well, for Palace, actually this year, it was particularly good because we managed to sell for five, um, four, four different uh, um, uh, new partners that we met uh, during the pandemics. Uh, and and this experience would not be able um, if we didn't have these virtual meetings and the grants from the Brazilian publishers because uh, all the contracts we signed, uh, the publishing houses that bought, they said that uh, they could sign the contract, but they would only publish if they get a grant. And since, yes, and since Portuguese is not a, a very common language, like, I don't know, English or maybe French or international language, a strong language, uh, the grants are very important. And so we managed to sell rights to Mexico, to Slovenia, to Mozambique and to France. And for us, it was, Fantastic. I, I think I never sold so many uh, rights in, in one year <laughs> and not, not going to a book fair. And it was really nice for us. It's very impressive. Congratulations on this. I, I know what you mean too, because in some of the smaller languages, um, good translation actually becomes quite expensive uh, because the available translators may not be as many who can work from Portuguese into other languages. And you're right, I think, I think the, the subsidy of a grant is very important. One of the associations I think is doing such a good job with this is publishing Scotland, um, which comes out with four or five different rounds of grants every year. Um, it's a very big program and they're moving a great deal of Scottish material into the world this way in a, in a very impressive program. And I'm delighted for you. Congratulations to you and to Palas for it being so, such a successful year. Yes, it was, for us, it was also surprising that we managed to do this, all of this. 
Um, and also, for instance, we were in Brazil and we had the notice in the beginning of the year that we were running for the Bob Prize in the Bologna Book Fair for the third time. Wow. We didn't get the prize, but uh, it was surprising that uh, this is a kind of prize that uh, the other publishers point out uh, the, for the finalists. Mm -hmm. So mainly it means that uh, you, you should be on the fair every year and meeting people so people can remember you and can remember the, the work you are doing. And, but we are not there and the, the fair didn't happen and we were in the finalist for the third time. So for us, it's already a big prize to be remembered like this. And so it was, although uh, we were uh, working at home and we, we still are, and it's, I think it's more tiring than going to the office, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a big prize for us to be remembered like that. So, um, so what I would like to say is that uh, the grants are very, we, we have used some grants as an independent publisher. Mm -hmm. We have used some grants to publish our books, uh, even books from authors who speak Portuguese, from Angola, from Portugal. There is a grant from the Portuguese government to support printing, for instance, and to spread uh, the Portuguese language and the Portuguese speaking authors uh, from other countries but Brazil to Brazil. So we use the grants on Portuguese language even to publish authors outside, from outside Brazil, in Brazil. Um, and we use uh, grants from uh, the French uh, government, the French Institute. Uh, so these were the two experiences I had with grants, but, uh, and I think they were fundamental for us because otherwise we wouldn't be able to, to release so many new titles. And on the other hand, the grant we, we have in Brazil are, are being very important for, for selling rights as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's excellent. Thank you, and thanks thanks for giving us this picture of how it looks from where you are. I, I think that sometimes we we can forget the very fundamental and essential uh, nature of these grants programs. Um, in fact, the uh, I was mentioning the Sheikh Zayed Book Award in relationship to uh, Michael's uh, win for the twenty twenty one translation prize, and they do actually um, issue grants on several of their nine categories to help try to move um, Arabic literature better into the world and faster into the world. And it's been a very important part of the mission of the Zayed program. Um, and that, that is an interesting case in which uh, we have an awards body that's providing grants um, and in a way backing its winners in an interesting way. They're saying, we think this is an important enough book that we will help you publish it in other languages. I, I like that. There's a our phrase, putting your money where your mouth is, um, is definitely in, in play when you see something like that. So thank you. It's, it's great to hear this report from, from Brazil and from how things are looking uh, from the publisher's standpoint. Um, speaking of Michael, let me, let me move to him. If I may, Michael, I, I don't know if your ears were burning yesterday, but I was doing another uh, program of this kind with some Arabic language uh, specialists and people who work in translation on Arabic and we were praising your work and, and talking about how successful it's been. And we were, we were also talking about something that you and I had mentioned before that I'd love for you to touch on in, in this conversation, if you can, about uh, adaptation and the fact that sometimes, in fact, particularly with classical work, what we have called translation is sometimes an adaptation. But in the current um, situation we're in, we saw, I don't know, I think two years ago, the arrival of the first um, Arabic adaptation moving to Netflix, of all things, um, a kind of science fiction horror piece coming out of Egypt. 
Um, not the kind of thing I would normally watch, but under the circumstances, yeah, because you want to support this. And of course, Netflix is an example of such a phenomenon in the world today. They come out with between 27 and 30 languages at once with one of these massive productions they, they produce themselves. Um, that is a form of adaptation we understand better today than perhaps the, the more subtle tra uh, adaptation process that occurs in translation, particularly in the classics that you were talking about. But, but help us understand a little bit where things lie in terms of Arabic and your experience of translation and success with it. Because as a point I was making with our friends yesterday is there are almost two subjects here. One is classical Arabic literature and one is contemporary Arabic literature. And they seem to be approaching the world both through different audiences, of course, but at different paces at times. What do you, what do you think? Uh, I should stop talking and let you talk. Well, hello, everyone. And um, uh, first, I have to say, I mean, thank you for that very kind introduction. And I, I will probably never be in a situation where I have so many publishers around me. So I, I want to say, first of all, how much uh, we appreciate all the work you're doing, uh, because without you, of course, um, nothing that we do would ever see the light of day. Um, from the supply side, so to speak, uh, the problem that we have as translators is that really no one ever sets out to be a translator of Arabic or, and, and I think I can speak for um, other, what we call less commonly taught languages in the United States. Um, although that of course is shifting, you know, what, what's commonly taught and what's not, but, but very few people set out in life to be say a, a translator of Korean, despite the great success that tra some translators of Korean have had. Um, so what happens is that those of us who uh, attain some level of expertise in these languages do so almost always through an academic track. And it also so happens that uh, the academic uh, the process of acquiring expertise in these languages almost never pays attention to translation, except as an exercise in what people imagine is scholarly accuracy. So uh, those who become scholars and professors of say Arabic are trained to this ideal of, of academic and, and scholarly exactitude, which is more or less exactly what you don't want if you're translating literature. So anyone who comes out of this process who can translate something that anyone would care to read, if that happens, it happens by accident. Um, and so uh, th there's a strange process by which publishers might look to academics to translate and especially to evaluate other uh, translations and drafts uh, submissions by other academics. And so the cycle continues where there isn't a real writer involved at any stage, um, except to the extent that publishers themselves are able to see that, right? Um, and to the extent that occasionally, I think uh, people who are not in the field of Arabic are actually brought in to talk about whether a particular work is, is, is viable um, from the point of view of English uh, or whatever your target language might be. Um, now, there are people who are doing good work to change this, um, and you've mentioned some of them already. Um, I want to give a shout out to the American Literary Translators Association, uh, because um, they have been doing fantastic work um, in promoting translation across a great many languages by honoring uh, works now in two categories, prose and poetry. And I think the short lists are coming out very soon. Um, the long list came out at the beginning of September. Um, and so that kind of recognition is really key as, as a way of setting the standard. I mean, this is these are the kinds of translations that we should be aiming to do no matter what your first language is. Um, and uh, another, since we're talking about Arabic, um, yes, uh, Porter, it's quite true that the, 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 the economy for uh, for translations of Arabic, of modern and contemporary Arabic literature as a distinct field from, from classical literature. And until recently, I would have said that classical literature wasn't even a player. Um, it's more or less restricted to, um, you know, traditionally it's been restricted to things like the Thousand and One Nights, translations of the Quran and so on and so forth. Uh, that has changed in the past 10 years, thanks to the work being done by the Library of Arabic Literature, which is a project um, based in based at the, at New York University in Abu Dhabi, 
uh, whose publishing partner is New York University Press. And it's thanks to this project uh, and the support it's received from the government of Abu Dhabi that we've been able to produce a series of something like 70 bilingual editions of classical Arabic work. So what, we're, what we originally set out to do was to do something like the Loeb classical series where you've got you know, Greek on one side and English on the other or Latin on one side and English on the other. And that obviously is, is rather a, a niche. It's, it's a very exclusive and restricted kind of audience. But what's happened is some of the works have become popular enough that we've been able to put them out as uh, monolingual, single language paperbacks. Mm -hmm. um, and NYU has done a great job in terms of design and marketing. And the books are really beautiful. And mine is not the first to break into a slightly larger market. Um, so James Montgomery's translations of the poetry of Antar uh, was also, I think, a finalist um, in the American Literary Translators Association list. Uh, and so we are getting noticed. Um, the New York Times has mentioned several of our books, um, not mine, I'm not sure why, but <laughs> several of my colleagues have had their books uh, mentioned uh, in, in the New York Times as you know, new and notable books. Um, so it's, um, it, it's, it, it's thanks to this kind of initiative uh, that we're able to give a bigger profile to, uh, to classical Arabic literature. I know um, exactly what you mean, if I can interrupt you for a moment. Uh, Chip Rossetti. Um, from the library was with us yesterday and he's very proud of the paperback editions that can come out in English um, so that these these pieces are actually getting some traction in the market which is a fantastic as you say a fantastic offshoot of of the program I, I think it's making great strides it has been fantastic and and one of the nice things about the books also is there's been a real effort to create a visual language to kind of right. To, to create an identity and a, a kind of icon, iconic presence for classical Arabic literature. So I, I suspect that the generation, you know, my students and, and their students will always think of Arabic literature as being this, this particular kind of yellow paperback from, from NYU Press, which is, that's what we want, right? Uh, exactly. We want that kind, kind of branding. Um, Good branding, exactly. <laughs> so um, so to, the, to the last point you raised, and this is something that I, I know I'm, I'm probably gonna fly off in, into, um, into some speculation now, but, um, one of the things that I've learned from working with the Lao group, with the Library of Arabic Literature, is that um, the, the intuitive way to do things or the traditional way of doing things often turns out not to be the best way. Um, and we've done a lot of things to revolutionize the way classical Arabic literature is, is published and, and, and the way it's presented. And so if I'm trying to think about how to broaden that in terms of translation more generally, um, the most successful translations of Arabic and Persian, as it happens, into English over the centuries uh, have been adaptations rather than translations. So I'm thinking of Fitzgerald translation of Omar Khayyam, uh, thinking of Burton's translation of The Thousand and One Nights, and more recently, uh, the various uh, Americanizations of the Persian poet Rumi, uh, who apparently at, at some point may still be the uh, best-selling poet in English, right? Even though he's a medieval Persian poet. Uh, of course, the Persian specialists are tearing their hair out because the translations are quite distant from their originals um, and sometimes produced by people who don't know Persian at all. Now, this is a sticky one because on the one hand, I would say that you don't want to misrepresent, obviously, the culture that you're translating from. You don't want to exoticize it. You don't want to you don't want to force it to serve a particular agenda that you may have or a particular stereotype that readers may have about this other culture. On the other hand, though, in the debate that academics like to have between what we call foreignization and what we call domestication, I'm firmly on the side of domestication. And I think one of the ways that domestication can work uh, is through what Porter mentioned, which is adaptation. In other words, Many of the problems that translation and translators face would be solved at a stroke if we accepted a category of adaptation, which is a matter of not, uh, not charging a particular individual with carrying over the vision of the original, but rather mm -hmm. recreating the original in a way that sidesteps some of the difficulties of transculturation uh, by creating a version of the work 
that is appropriate to the target culture. And this would all be theoretical, except for the fact that Netflix does it all the time. Um, it's not just that they subtitle their shows in many different languages. It's that there's actually a different version of the show for different countries. Um, now, whether that would work in the case of literature, I don't know. Um, but I think it's worth considering the ways in which one might say, instead of translating the thousand and one nights again uh one might adopt it i mean that's just an, that's just an, that's just an, uh, an obvious example because it's been done so many times but if one were to extend this to other other kinds of works um so perhaps um there, there are ways to think outside the model of you know one book one translator and one product uh also because translation often is done best when it's done by more than one person uh and so when you expand it out to maybe teamwork and producing multiple versions of a work, there may be some possibilities there of, of expanding our audience as well. Putting two things you're saying together, which to me are, are interesting when, when laid side by side. If we were to say that translators in, in the aggregate in general, uh, there are some excellent writers in translation now and thank heavens for them. But uh, assuming that many people fall into translation, as you're saying, and don't set out to be translators, therefore may not be the writers we would like them to be when they are working in translation. Is it possible to think that if there were training to help um, translators understand what they could do with their talents to produce a better, uh, heavier quality product, would they not perhaps begin to see more of the opportunity in adaptation? I think it takes a good writer is what I'm saying to understand and certainly to accomplish the, a good adaptation. Um, and I think perhaps if, if we had folks trained to look for this opportunity and trained to bring forth their, their better capabilities as writers, we might get closer to, as you say, we're flying off here a little bit, but we might get closer to something of what you're talking about. Yeah? I discovered with my colleagues at the Library of Arabic Literature, uh, you know, we were soliciting projects. We would ask people around the world who work from Arabic to English to present projects for translations. And we found that when we gave people, um, when, we, when we gave people substantial compensation and a lot of creative freedom, about half of them did just what you say. And they did brilliant work as translators. And they realized that they've been in a closet all these years, not realizing that they can really make this stuff sing if they just get away from this uh, you know, pettifogging kind of uh, uh, focus on academic translation, but um, but then about half of them just couldn't make that jump. You know, they just said, you know what, I'm not just not comfortable with, and one would never know until one tries, really. Um, right. Uh, and and uh, yeah, and, and it, it's it's something that you, you, it's surprising which colleagues turn out to be in fact quite good translators, uh, and mm -hmm. which ones mm -hmm. realize that their talents don't lie in that area, and and that's fine too. I mean, we need both. Yeah. Uh, it also shows us that again, there's another set of two tracks here. There's there's as you're saying, one kind of translator who feels that uh, allegiance to the original is so important, and another kind of translator who can think of the more adaptive and uh, more expansive creativity of a different kind of working. Everything we, we tend to come across with Arabic seems to have a couple of approaches, at least two. There are far more than two, I'm sure. Before um, we, we move on, um, I want to ask one more thing, if I may. And I, I ask this gently, but this is the journalist's question, of course. Is there not in, in the fact that we would like to see more Arabic literature moving out into the rest of the world than we have seen so far? Um, despite the best work of all of these good programs, which are helping, of course. But would we get more Arabic literature into other cultures today if there weren't as many political assumptions? I'm, I'm saying it that way because so many of them are quite wrong about the Arab world. And I like to say the Arab worlds because it's not a monolithic culture at all. It's so many different cultures. But there are so many, um, there, there's a lot of baggage this is not the Arab world's fault in most cases, but there is a lot of baggage when people think from outside the region about um, anything connected to, to the Arab life and cultures and, and particularly the language. I feel that political reticence slows people down at times. Do you ever see this? Is it possible to ever put your finger on this or is it so nuanced and subtle that you can't find it? Well, some years ago, Edward Said actually took that point and ran with it, just the one you've made, um, talking about how 
uh, this was right around the time, it was the early 90s when Nagi Mahfouz had won the Nobel Prize. And he was talking about Arabic as being an embargoed literature that, that at that time, uh, he felt that audiences and publishers were reluctant to embrace Arabic precisely because of some of these assumptions. Um, but it, it, we have to admit that it's a, it's a double-edged sword because people are often drawn to it and learn about it precisely because of geopolitical events that you know we find deplorable and 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 it's it, that arabic is often prominent for the wrong reasons but at least that gets some people through the door at least that gets them to pay attention to it in the first place uh and then in some cases they will then learn uh you know they, they will then learn past that point um so uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't wish that we were obscure. You know, I wouldn't wish that we were, uh, be, because uh, we'd probably have even less, you know, attention paid to us than we do now. Um, but then the question is, once you decide that you're going to take advantage of that uh, notoriety, let's put it that way, um, uh, to get people in the door or you know onto your website or whatever it may be, the product that they find then has to strike a balance between. Um, teaching them something that they didn't know before without being too aggressively impenetrable or, or, or inaccessible or difficult to follow or whatever, uh, however you want to call it. So, so it's, a, and that's why really the translator is doing a balancing act between, between um, taking, meeting people where they are and teaching them something new. But then again, um, you know, writers themselves don't want to be in the position of teaching people things necessarily, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons that I embraced this particular work that I translated is that it's really not about teaching anybody anything. It's about word games. Uh, and so, uh, it, you know, it may be through embracing some of the more obscure byways of the tradition and some of the more humorous and playful elements that we can get past this thing that, you're, that, you've, that you've pointed out. It's, it's fascinating. You're right. It's very complicated to, to capitalize on the silver lining. Um, not not at all an easy thing, particularly in that in that field. Um, this is excellent commentary. Thank you so much, Michael. I, it's uh, just a fascinating realm and, and area of translation at this point in literature today. Let's move at this point to Nestan. Um, because speaking of politics, the Georgian culture is one that has been through an extraordinary political evolution um, over so many years and is. Um, as, as we've spoken before, Nestan is, is very much using its language at times as a great touchstone of its, its cultural identity, the, the nation, um, as we learned in, in Frankfurt during the guest of honor um, presentations a few years ago, the, the, the nation is very much tied to its language, both its alphabet and its literature and very uh, loyal to its writers, which I find exciting. Um, talk to me, if you will, Nestan, about your, your viewpoint um, from that very special part of the world of translated literature and the importance of it and the difficulties of it. Um, tell, us, tell us your viewpoints at this time. Thank you, Porter. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Nestan Unikadze, Georgian writer, also, uh, I live in Tbilisi. And, uh, well, I've published three novels, uh, some collected stories also. Um, I have a TV show together with my uh, friend writers, and this is very um, famous TV show. It's about literature, literature trigger is the title of this show. Um, so uh, today I want to share with uh, uh, some interesting points um, about Georgian literature, about um, translation topics, and how it uh, all began and where we are now. Uh, well, it was uh, 1999. Um, I was 18 years old, and four years uh, had passed since um, the lost war in Abkhazia, um, uh, which was preceded by two other wars um, as well. Uh, this was the time uh, that I decided with my friend to publish my first book. And this was the period um, at that time in our country, not only um, where there are no publishers looking for debut novels, even electricity was on a, hell, uh, on a shoulder. Uh, so the, our national wealth on that time was 
uh, Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, <laughs> which uh, put our, uh, our country on the world map, and the musician Irakli Charukiani, who with his wonderful militant songs gave us hope for the future. Um, and so my friend's uh, father found some uh, printing press in a building in the street, in the, uh, in the building of some uh, house. Uh, and um, uh, with the $100, we published uh, um, 500 copies of our books. Uh, so this is, um, th those were very bad stories actually, but um, this is how, how my uh, adventure begins. So, and after many years in Hamburg or in Frankfurt or in New York, um, on those big stages, I never forgot how it all began. And I still um, remember it because uh, um, a, a stranger as it sounds uh, that um, uh, the shaky and obscure uh, beginning uh, gave me uh, some power um, for, for after, afterwards. And just in, just in that period, in 1999, contemporary Georgian literature began to, to start, was starting to hold his um, positions, positions and um, become more and more uh, fashionable. And people uh, were gathering in some art cafes to listen to writers and poets in that period. And um, uh, after the Rose Revolution, uh, it was a period when the political and ideological course was already set. And um, it was clear that it was the path to the West. And um, this crossword of civilization, you know, Georgia writers had waited so, so many years for their Western friends. And um, it would be not wrong to say that lo a lot of Georgian writers are lost uh, be to the, for the world, uh, to the world because of its um, uh, long wait. Uh, because of this, uh, it was very important that post-revolution period, it was clear that uh, the way was uh, already seen and the book, uh, all, this, all main uh, things, uh, for example, uh, National Book Center was made in that period and um, association of uh, um, publishers and distribution as well, as well. The Ministry of Culture was part of, uh, of this uh, as uh, this was uh, the political will. And it was very important because the, uh, the president for translation pr translations created for first time it began like uh, Georgian names uh, began to appear, appear in uh, American anthologies, in German anthologies. Uh, for, for the first time, it was like um, a few poems, uh, some uh, plays, uh, stories. Um, it was, um, uh, and slowly uh, with uh, uh, context, they, they um, created from many, many other countries uh, some names already with their novels were translated. And it, it was slow process because foreign publishers had to think Hard and you know there is uh, there was a lack of translators as well, especially foreign translations uh, translators who knew a Georgian language, um, but they did everything. I mean this. Um, people in the uh, top of this um, book center uh, and association. And so uh, our hand waving was like <laughs> from our lo uh, lost uh, island already notice. Um, finally, after, after much work, you know, we got to the culmination and uh, it was uh, 2018 uh, when we had the guest of honor at the uh, Frankfurt Book Festival and it was Mm, there was about uh, uh, 300 books translated for, for that event and uh, actually it was mostly it was um, uh, contemporary it were com contemporary authors as well as um, our classics um, uh, so um, it's very important uh, that uh, after 2008, uh, after the uh, Georgia, uh, after the Russia-Georgia August War, uh, it was clear for independent Georgian literature um, that we uh, refused to uh, our biggest market, Russia, uh, and it was um, and it was like. A, 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 on the way to find uh, other other markets and enter new and uh, alternative uh, ways to to 
promote uh, everything. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, in fact, uh, in Georgia is a small language, remain the most difficult issues. But today we are in a good condition uh, from translating from, from other languages, you know, as illustrating, for example, um, by this year nomination uh, of our very famous and important um, uh, literary a word, Saba, um, which include, for example, Jalaladin Rumi, um, Ellie Smith, for example, and Elena Ferrante as well, and uh, not to mention Elliot's Cats. It's perfect translations, really. But we have uh, not such a luxury uh, translated jo Georgian uh, authors to another languages. Of course, there are excellent uh, translators, but uh, mm, not so uh, many countries and uh, languages are, are covered. That's why this problem, um, you know, uh, uh, Georgian language is spoken uh, by only 4 million uh, people at best in this um, whole world. And you know what kind of problems and challenge this is. Um, uh, I want to mention three, um, shortly three cases uh, to, to uh, make clear what I mean. Uh, obviously in Germany, for example, Dino Haratishvili's name increased uh, interest in, in Georgia literature. You know? um, consequently, uh, for us, it was a kind of pass for, for another, for, for other publishers. Um, and um, uh, her name is associated with a um, very interesting project. For example, that was supported by Goethe Institute and the Ministry of um, and the uh, and German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it um, mean, meant that it involved Georgian and uh, German authors to work together to travel um, through Georgia and to make two, two diff different uh, um, texts. And um, uh, this project uh, was interesting because um, German translator of the Georgian authors uh, was provided by Rachel Greatsford, for, for example, a German translator uh, who is fluent in Georgian that was very comfortable of course uh, with the same uh, type of support of for example British uh, Council we partnered with um, Royal Court Theatre and the project was um, it was a two year uh, project involved writing a place and then translated into English and it was interesting that the opportunity was uh, the collaboration with uh, Mr. Donald Rayfield, uh, an excellent translator and professor of, of Georgian languages um, and the, uh, for example in my place uh, in my play um, uh, one um, one very funny uh, character tells a spell uh, and uh, I knew this spell from my Megrelian grandmother. Megrelian is an old uh, Georgian language that is still spoken in some Megrelo. And I thought Mr. Donald Rayfield would ask me uh, some additional questions, at least about this spell, uh, this Megrelian spell. Uh, but no, uh, when we got uh, our uh, place, my play was excellent, better than uh, original. And my grandfather, grandmother's spell was uh, also um, perfectly translated. Uh, Donald Drapel with his uh, um, connection to Georgia, um, you know, he, he's published a lot of books about the history of Georgia, about the literature of Georgia, and it is uh, the best case I can uh, now um, say, but, um, you know, it's not not, not enough. Uh, and for example, one more uh, case, uh, it was uh, like uh, um, UN Women uh, Georgian office together with the Swedish uh, uh, Swedish government. Uh, uh, um, they made fairy tales um, about the bravest and very interesting jo female Georgian authors. And we wrote um, uh, this uh, fairy tales and um, it was translated into English also and I was presented myself uh, this book in New York for example and it was very um, important because the response uh, the, uh, that followed was very um, was great really. Uh, all these cases I cited examples where um, the function of grants and uh, financial support is um, 
clear clear uh, scene you know uh, there was support and there was financial uh, opportunity the best translators um, made their translations and the project was um, responsible so it's um, utterly important and uh, this is also um, shows um, how how it's important to 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 um, for for small language and uh, these sp special programs um, are especially important attracted uh, translators and uh, from different countries and also as well as training locals. So, Thank you. Um, Nesta, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to break in just because we're very close to time here. Yeah, but I, I think you're making this point very, very well. And you're reflecting some of what Michael was saying about the value of actually very good translation. It sounds like you've been in some good hands and I'm glad to hear it. So, so thank you for this input. It, it's been very good to hear exactly what your viewpoint is from the author's standpoint, and, and as I was saying, a very special market. And I want to thank all of you for being with us. It's, it's been such an interesting conversation. Uh, Mariana, Paola, Michael, and Nestin, you, you each brought such a fine perspective to it. As, as we leave this morning, I'd like to, we're switching gears just for a second, to say that if you'll check uh, Publishing Perspectives, uh, you'll see a story on a very interesting new initiative being led by the IPA in terms of climate change. Um, the organization's president, Badur al Qasimi, um, has helped the organization move in alignment with other organizations. And I'm saying associations like the Federation of European Publishers. They are gathering together to understand how to make their own operations work best for climate change and crisis and to send out the right messages to the rest of the world to get on board with this emergency that affects all of us. So while that is not a translation point, I wanted to let you know that this is today's news coming from the IPA. And I want to wish you an international translation day, a happy one. So everybody do take care, do read a translation before the end of the day. And thank you for joining us. I'm Porter Anderson, and it's been great to be with you. Have a nice day and evening. Yes. <laughs>